I'm loving the Spark stuff. I love the cab with my Spark Mini going through it, and also that was my Spark Go. I have a Spark Go. I mean, if you would have showed me this in 1978, I would have thought you were from another planet, you know? Hey everyone, I'm Dre Demira here today on behalf of Positive Grid to sit down with legendary Cars guitarist Elliot Easton. We're going to talk all things guitar, tone, and Spark Cab. Elliot, thank you for having us over. My pleasure. Appreciate it. You have a lovely home and studio here. We've been hanging out and jamming, checking out your uh, incredible collection of vintage guitars. Uh, talk to me about like your first tone moment, like the first time you heard a guitar tone that just like lit that fire in you and, and drew you to the instrument. The first stuff I remember really being struck by was the surf stuff and the ventures, because at that time, rock and roll wasn't rocking like it was in 57, 58, and 59. The predominant music was like girl groups, Phil Spector, great music, but it wasn't very guitar centric. There wasn't like a lot of guitar up front. And so for that, you heard like the surf music, Pipeline, and Walk Don't Run by The Ventures, maybe Dwayne Eddy. The Shadows. Yeah, well, yeah. I didn't know The Shadows being a, you know, a little kid in Long Island. They were an English group. English group, yeah. uh, we had The Ventures. And so, you know, that was, that was like the first like rock and roll that, that was new in my life that had like guitar up front. Because like I say, it was like a lot of thrill building, girl group, and all the Frankies from Philadelphia, you know, and, uh, and, and so, you know, it was that time. So the first like guitar tones, I guess that I was like really attracted to was that twangy reverby sound of Fender guitars and Moserat guitars, you know, with the Ventures. I was 10 years old when the Beatles played the Sullivan Show, and that was a life-changing experience for me. I'd already been playing guitar, like I said. After seeing that, like, I remember that night, like, my whole body was vibrating, and I, I tossed and turned the whole night. I, I just, like, I don't know if I could say I saw my future. That sounds a little pretentious, but I just basically said, that's for me, you know, because they just sounded so great and looked great and having so much fun and girls are screaming. It, it looked like a pretty good, you know, job. Pretty good gig. <laughs> yeah, good gig. Yeah. I was very into all the early British invasion bands and, and, and played that stuff, you know, Who, Kinks, Stones, Beatles. Later on in the 60s, white boy blues started becoming a little more popular and I picked up on that early on with the Butterfield Blues Band and mm -hmm. John May all over in England. With the, and I loved it. I fell in love with playing blues. And, and so I would buy all the records I could of that. And some of my heroes at the time were Mike Bloomfield, uh, like the Super Session. And, Played with Bob Dylan. and Oh, yeah. 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 Um, Otis Rush, Albert King. I loved Buddy Guy, Roy Buchanan. All of those tones largely being cleaner, cleaner tones, or like more pure guitar tones, like kind of pre-maestro well, fuzz box well, I'll tell you, satisfaction era. I'll tell you what, my very first rock concert was Jimi Hendrix opening for the Monkees at Forest Hills Tennis Stadium. He just played the Monterey Pop Festival like the week before. And they put 1967. Yeah. Summer, yeah. Yeah. That was the first time I ever heard a guitar go, woo because all we'd ever heard was clean, twangy sounds mostly. Talk about being struck by a tone. Imagine seeing Jimi Hendrix without any preparation or even knowing who he was. If you said he was dropped in from another planet, it would have been very believable. I can only imagine it. You know, I'm jealous. It was <laughs> crazy. I still remember his voice because like, it was all little 12-year-old girls going, Mickey, Davey, for the monkeys. And Jimmy came on and... The moms were, co were covering their daughter's eyes because he's like doing his act, you know. And uh, I don't think he got through more than a few songs because it was just crazy, you know. It was just a monkey's audience. He had no business that she shouldn't have been on that tour. Did you, did you try to go home and emulate those sounds? Well, yourself? no. I, I had no idea how they were being made. So I, it, was, it was not even a question of that. I, it came, that came along later. And, and, and as like an extension of blues and then... You had Hendrix with like Red House and like Electric Ladyland, like playing like, you know, Voodoo Child and stuff with some straight, like real blues. And uh, I, I think that's one of the best things he did. He just, he was one of the best blues guitarists. Never mind all the other stuff that he added to it. Um, but I loved him. I loved uh, a few of the guys that played with John Mayall. I, I really uh, listened a lot to Mick Taylor with John Mayall. Mm -hmm. Not as much with it when he was with the Stones, but 
He was on two male albums, Bare Wires and Blues from Laurel Canyon. Well, didn't he replace Clapton when Clapton left to form Cream? No, Peter Green did. And then, and then, then Mick Taylor. Then Mick. Got it. So it was pre-Fleetwood, Peter Green, then Mick came in. Correct. Then Mick joined the Stones. Then Mick joined the Stones. It's like I, the incestuous family of the British blues boom. Yeah, that whole yeah, scene I mean, is like, so intertwined. And Mick asked Mail, you know, we need a new guitar player. You know, who, who, who can you recommend? That's like, you know, five foot seven and can do their own makeup or whatever it was, you know. <laughs> and um, maybe somewhat unselfishly, uh, he recommended Mick, but, but Mick Taylor got the gig. Uh, I loved his playing. I love Cream, Eric Clapton, uh, that era of Eric Clapton I love. Disraeli Gears is like in my top ten albums. I love it. Um, and that was an influence. And then on the American side... I was kind of a funny kid because I, I wasn't like Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, you know, that kind of Black Sabbath. I didn't listen to any of that stuff. I was into the band and like some San Francisco rock like Moby Grape and even certain dead the stuff. Flock. No. 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 Was that too folky? I just too sucky. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I saw the dead quite a few times between like 69 and 71, which... You either get it or you don't. I loved Jesse Ed Davis' playing with Taj Mahal. Mm -hmm. And like I said, Robbie Robertson with the band. And then the Birds came out with that Sweetheart of the Rodeo album, and it kind of <sighs> opened country up. It I took, spent a lot of time with that, that record. Oh, it's me too. Me, yeah. I, I got it, I think, the week it came out. I always loved country music. And in fact, it's funny because my dad, he would ride at dude ranches, and he watched every Western on TV. And we had this Marty Robbins album. And all, my dad and all his brothers, all my uncles had the same record called Gunfighter Ballads and Trail <laughs> Songs or something. Had a pink cover and had El Paso on it, with that great Grady Martin lead stuff. I was like a radical hippie kid and I was kind of turned off by the political aspect of country music at that time. Nashville was very conservative kind of thing and it was during Vietnam and a lot of things were going on. But when the birds came out with it, it was a whole different story with Graham Parsons and... and and it just, then I, I got it so, so much more because it was, you know, hippies playing. Were you like picking stuff off that, the record? Like were you oh, learning yeah. licks from that? Oh yeah. I play You Ain't Going Nowhere and some of those Ooh, things. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, 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 it's great. Uh, uh, so what was the genesis then for you? Like when you began to emulate, because obviously by the time we get to the cars, there's, you know, a very diverse array of tones. Hmm. Um, on the record. So what was the, the, the genesis like going from, you know, being so inspired by, by rockabilly, um, you know, moving through country music, yeah. largely being, you know, clean tones with some reverb to you know, some of the more to overdriven, more heavier, affected, modulated tones that you yeah. hear here as the, the cars form. I had all these influences. And so when the cars came along, I kind of had this eclectic vocabulary to draw on. And I could approach different styles. I might play a clean telecaster with some slap back and in that, you know, maybe on something like Best Friends Girl or, you know, plug the Les Paul in and wail on some of the other solos. What I would do, and, and which is maybe a tip for people, is when we were recording, I would never go and grab for a guitar and a pedal and an amp before I heard the sound in my head. Because I, I discovered that if I really didn't know what I was looking for, I'd be picking up guitars, putting them down again, trying this pedal, trying that pedal, trying swapping out amps. But if I could hear it in my head, I would go right to the right guitar and the right equipment every time. And so I would try That's to... That's great advice. You know? Great so advice. Before, before I'd even... <laughs> thanks. So before I'd really pick up the guitar, I'd like envision what I was going for. So I was always very oriented to like the right sound for the right part. Very intentional. Totally. Yeah. And so, you know, I could be kind of chameleon-like in that way, depending on what the song called for. What did that look like as far as the, the kit, like, the, you know, the physical kit that you had in the studio? Oh, um, you'll laugh. You know, to create all of those tones and then compare it to, like, what you can get in a box or, like, in your phone now? The Man, we made the record in London at Air Studios, George Martin's studio. And... I only owned two electric guitars. I had a Telecaster and that Les Paul Custom. And so I brought those with me and I only owned two pedals. The brand new Boss CE1 Chorus, 
and a Morley Echo volume. <laughs> And I didn't use either of them, and I didn't use any overdrive pedal. It's just all cranked amp. For things that would, you'd think had chorus on them, like, um, like Bye Bye Love, say, it goes, nah, 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 nah. Yeah. it's got jangle to it. And Roy, who's like a Monty Python character, would, oh, no, no, my love, we'll do it the old way. And he'd have me double track. He'd have me play the part once, and then very speed at a few uh, cents. Wow, okay. With that wobble. Like the Beatles, like clapped in on while well, my guitar, yeah, 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 or whatever, you know, and it, it was an organic way of getting the chorus. And then there was no way I was going to need a, a morally echo pedal when he's got Studer half tracks for slap back and echo, you know, and, and delay. So I had no use for the pedals I brought at all. I never, never used them, and um, we had mostly Ampeg amps for that first record and a twin. Um, very little gear. We were poor. We were broke. I mean, you know, the amazing thing is that that we got signed. It's it's a bit of a story, but the, the cars were, were kind of gaining like notoriety in the in Boston, New England area, and we made a demo tape, just a live two-track demo tape of a couple of songs and just what I needed and Best Friends Girl were two of them. The big FM rock station in Boston was WBCN. And the big primetime DJ was Max Ann, who became our angel in a way, because she put our demo tape into heavy rotation. And it started getting reported nationally. There were radio tip sheets, like there was one called The Gavin Report. Bill Gavin was a big guy on radio. And I think there was one called The Wednesday Morning Quarterback. And all the radio stations in the country would sub subscribe to them. You would open it up, say the Gavin Report, and see what WBCN was playing a particular week. And there was a column for the band, the record, and the label. And so it might say, you know, Aerosmith, Get Your Wings, Columbia, Elton John, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, Rocket. Oh, so they MCA. knew where to go to get, wait, to get the record wait. to play it? And it said the Cars, Best Friends Girl, tape. So all these A and R guys, <laughs> all these A and R guys and radio guys around the country are going, "What the hell's going on in Boston? These guys are getting reported in the Gavin Report on a tape. They're in heavy rotation in, in a big market." So A and R people started flying up to Boston from New York and checking out our club dates, and that's really what led to us getting a record deal. That brings us to going to England for an unproven band. They rolled out the the red carpet. I mean, I don't think it could ever happen today. They they flew us to London, put us up in a house in Mayfair with a, a cook and, a, and a, a housekeeper, gave us a, like a Range Rover, I think, and a Jaguar to get to the studio and back, and gave us a big budget and put us in George Martin's studio in London. And it's like we hadn't even accomplished anything yet except that our demo tape was on Boston, uh, being played a lot in Boston. So it was this incredible thing to happen. And the record took 12 days to record, and nine days to mix. We were there for 21 days and went home. And, um, and people are still enjoying it. That's great. Do you feel like there was an influence that Boston had on driving the band forward as far as you know, becoming a successful band? But sonically, do you feel like there was stuff happening in Boston at the time that Not pushed you or were you pulling from different... Not sonically spaces. anything that would have, would have influenced the music we played, but, but the atmosphere in the town was very conducive to like bands playing original music because there was tons and tons of college students, and so they would support local bands. And where I came from, like in Long Island, you had to play Top 40 like to, to work, and we were actually able to scrape by in the cars playing our own songs before we ever had a deal. Maybe we were making $150 each a week back then, but it was enough to pay your rent and, and eat, believe it or not. And I remember like Paul McCartney was recording in the next studio, we were there at one point, and George Martin actually came in to listen to, it, to what we were recording. And, and you know how there's always a sofa in front of the mixing desk, and he was lying down on the sofa like by the window to the studio and listening, and he listens listen to a playback and the tape stops and he gets up and he goes, he goes, that wasn't bad, actually. And we were like, <laughs> bummed. We're like, oh, man. And when he left, the engineer said, no, 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 you don't understand. That's the best thing he ever, if he loves something, he says, that's not bad, actually. And so we felt better about it then. Um, that dry British wit. Yeah. yeah. But it was just a very heady <laughs> thing. 
it was it was the winter of 77 punk rock was exploding in london you could walk down the king's road see all the guys like pink mohawks this high and all the clothes and the music and it, it was a great time to be in london too i mean it was just so much fun um and you can hear it you know that we were having a great time on the record because yeah, you know, it's all yeah, it captured that energy. Yeah, you can't fake that. So it's 1978 or 77. You finish recording the album. Yeah. The album comes out in June right, 78. May, June, yeah, spring 78. And then you hit the road. You go on tour Pretty to promote much. the album. Pretty much. And, and, you know, the way it worked was we would be the opening act for, for national acts for a while. And then as the record started catching on, we would headline in like big clubs, like maybe the Park West in Chicago mm -hmm. or, you know the Roxy here. So it was a combination of kind of playing like large showcase clubs that national acts would play and playing like arenas and stuff opening for, for other, acts. other acts. And that's, that's typical of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then eventually we graduated to headlining ourselves. And Talk me through the process of going from, you know, having recorded the songs on the self-titled album uh, with those different tones, right? And with yeah. those, like you said, effects created in the conventional sense without a stomp box yeah. or without a rig. How did you then recreate that, translate that to the live show when you guys started performing? Well, I just plugged the chorus and the, the echo pedal back in because, I, I, I mean, I couldn't create it the way we did in the studio. Back then, there wasn't that much. You know, there was an echoplex. The Morley had a magnetic rotating disc that sort of like recorded and like played back the repeats. It was, you know early days but I, I would use it you know sparingly like for best friend's girl you could just use the volume the, the pedal to bring in some delay so i'd bring it in a little bit for the slap back maybe longer for some solo stuff like that not, did that change uh you know by the time you get to like say Heart, uh, heartbeat city oh by the time we get to heartbeat you're city using different equipment i've got a bradshaw rig that i wouldn't even know how to turn on myself <laughs> <laughs> it's like the size of a refrigerator you know, You're using like the digital chorus and delay yeah, units. Yeah, because the... it was before the SPX 90s and stuff. They were, or or the the A A fours or whatever the Korg one was, A threes. They weren't multi effects units, so you had to have a box for each effect. You know, like you know, had a TC spatial expander, a TC twenty two ninety delay, um, an even tied harmonizer, the H three thousand. Yeah, oh, it's all, my favorite. Although you know, you had to have like that thing in your rack. Yeah. And so it was like really a complex setup, you know. I even had a 50 watt Marshall head that was in the rack that I could kick in. So yeah, it went from like being very, very simple to I wouldn't even know how to set it up. And but now you have those tones in a yeah, <laughs> in a now, spark. Now I, I, I can now I can go on my my iPhone app and like have fun for hours picking, you know, just fantasizing about a rig that, you know, oh, I'd love to, I wish I had, you know, Marshall through, you know, an Echoplex with this and that. And you just go on the app and you just dial it in and it's there and it's very realistic sounding. What impresses me most is the way it feels under your fingers. Like it feels like an amp. It's got the bloom and it breathes. So it's no, there's no like really compromise about it. It's just a lot more convenient. I mean, if you would have showed me this in 1978, I would have thought you were from another planet, you know. Would you have taken it out with you? Do you think you could have, like, played the car set at that time with a spark? Yeah, I think I could because it wasn't that complicated. It was just basically clean or overdrive, clean or dirty. And I would literally reach back and turn the amp up for the overdrive, <laughs> turn it down for best friend's girl. I mean, it was that, it was, it was just like that, you know that basic now forget about it forget about it you, you forget about it. you got every amp you could think of in that app and you've got the hendrix package where you could just have a ball with and, and all these different things for the folks that don't know you can play like a, a rhythm track and a jam with yourself in it or, or or play some chords and it'll come up with a bass line or you could use it to play along with spotify or just you know streaming music and just jam along it's a fantastic tool for like learning stuff, practicing and just having fun, just like, you know, sitting in front of the TV and noodling. I mean, I, I just, I take it with me from room to room. It's just, I mean, it's so, it's so convenient. And you've embraced it. I have. I think it, it's as a progenitor 
right, in, in incorporating technology into, into pop and rock music. Yeah. Um, what, what is it that draws you to, to new technology and inspires you? Well, you know, I've got to be honest with you. I'm not really that drawn to, like, a lot of tech stuff. And that was kind of what I dug about this. I mean, I put a few hours in of tweaking some settings and, and really never went back and messed with it. If you want to add something or change amps, it's just so easy. Because uh, I'm like kind of a Luddite. I'm not really a tech guy. So um, I'm not big on learning curves and thick manuals and stuff like that. And none of that was really necessary. So it's just like self-explanatory. It's like, oh, yeah, well, there's an amp. Very I'll intuitive. Turn up the bass, turn up the treble. Yeah. You know, it, it's, just, it's just like what it is in the real world. You know, it just, you know, you're looking at a pedal and it's got three knobs on it and you're tweaking it and it's just like a regular pedal. The beauty part is you can save it and, and get back to that sound if you find something you really love. That would be a big difference, right? Like when you're, you're working with, I mean, analog gear, let alone, uh, or rather digital gear, let alone analog gear before you, you know, you're saying you built the rack. Yeah. It's like being able to recall those things later, even even in the studio, if you wanted to like recapture that tone, you would have had to have like a, a, a recall sheet, right? That would yeah, have had like the yeah. information but, on it. But you know what? At the end of the day, it just sounded like me. That, I know that's a cliche, but it really does. Like I, I, I just sound like me pretty much whatever I play through. Yeah. You know, some people can can shred and play blindingly fast, and some people don't play that way and, and play, you know, more melodically or whatever and I think it comes down to your nervous system I think it's how you're wired as a person because when I was at Berkeley I knew guys who were playing for six months and could play like as fast as John McLaughlin and I could never if I practiced from now till doomsday it's just like some people talk really fast and, and some people are like slow lazy kind of laconic way of talking and I think it's really how a person is wired your vibrato is so tied to your nervous system. Some people have a fast, shaky vibrato. Some people have a languid, beautiful, singing vibrato. And um, I think a lot of it just comes down to how you're wired. You know, your vibrato is kind of like who you, it's kind of like your fingerprint in a way. Like you can mm. tell B.B. King in one note because of his vibrato. Talk me through your process too when it comes to composing a solo. I think your influences are well documented, mm -hmm. um, but I, I'd be curious to know, and I'm sure uh, viewers would be curious to know what that process looked like, um, you know, when thinking about the contour and the sweep of the solo, like, you know, yeah. being a song within a song, what, what's that like? I would actually try different things. I, I had, like, I might write a solo and then write a harmony to the solo and then throw away the solo and just play the harmony. Sometimes I would sing a solo into a cassette deck and try to learn what I just sang, because then it takes you away from these pentatonic boxes because you're freer with your voice. And so you'd surprise yourself and then you'd have to figure out on guitar what you sang, and it takes you, some un takes you to some unusual places. And then it's just, you know, whatever your influences are all get jumbled up and they come out as you. And so, you know, that's anybody. And um, I'm just, you know, the sum of everything that I've been influenced by. And sometimes it gets all mushed together and sometimes I'll single out a style for a particular song and try to play it more pure. Yeah, I, I love the story you told before about, um, you, you had mentioned going to the hotel rooms with like the demo tapes when you were in the studio and then yeah. you know, working on stuff separately and bringing that back to the studio. And it was fun because it was, you know, to blow the guys away because they didn't know what I was coming in with. And I come in all prepared with parts. Did they think you were improvising hooks, when you come in? intros solos and then live i'd play them because i felt like it, it kind of felt like cheating the audience if you didn't some people like don't want to play it like the record but i feel like it's more satisfying to the audience especially the kind of solos that i like to do which are kind of little part with a part of the song they're like little compositions it's such a such a joy to look down at the audience when you're playing the solo just like the record it's like he's doing it he's doing it. you know yeah and you're just so happy you know yeah um especially when it's a singable solo that, i feel like people expect to hear it in an era where there was definitely more emphasis on genre as far as the music business and being able to market a band um was there ever like conscious thought about how diverse the influences were that you were pulling from as far as or was it just like this is what we're doing creatively 
with no thought of like you know being able to put it in a box or it was that it was communicate it, was, it to anyone else. It, it was just like any band. It was like it was just the noise we made with the five of us in a room playing, and we had such different influences. For one thing, there was a nine-year spread in the band, with me as being the youngest. Um, so, you know, people were in their different places in life. I was like, you know, 22, 23. Rick had a wife and kid. Ben was married. Greg was married. So, um, and I was just a crazy kid, you know. So, um, we were very diverse people. We met in Boston, but came from all different parts of the country. And it wasn't sort of one of those bands of like, five guys who went to the same high school together and all had the same record collection yeah. and loved the same stuff. Very homogenous. Totally not. I yeah. mean, you know, you can see what each member brought to it. Greg with his Eno, Kraftwerk, you know, German synth kind of vibe and stuff. Rick very much into sort of like a Velvet Underground, Lou Reed, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan lyric kind of thing, beat poetry. Ben just, you know, beautiful pop star with a gorgeous voice and David was in the Modern Lovers with Roadrunner and, and all that and me I don't know what the hell I was you know because <laughs> but the glue <laughs> yeah I, mean, I don't know but when you put all those ingredients together the recipe worked and it was unique but we weren't trying to be unique we were each just doing our thing and it yeah. came together and that was the cars others would classify the cars as pop and rock or power pop uh, which obviously, you know, I feel like it transcends the, the labels, but do you feel like pop is, is it a genre or is like no. a sound or is it what's popular at the time? It's short for popular. Yeah. I mean, pop music was Rosemary Clooney and Frank Sinatra, Judy Garland. I mean, pop is pop. And even to prove the point further, growing up on AM radio in the 60s, you'd hear a Beatle track, then Louis Armstrong singing Hello Dolly, then The Stones, then Dean Martin, Everybody Loves Somebody. I mean, they played everything, you know, Motown. We heard everything on one station. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't com compartmentalized like it is now where you listen to one kind of music on each station and you never get turned on to anything other than what you know. And it has a specific, like, sonic... Yeah. character so it really opened your head up to like yeah. be, you know you, you took in all this kind of different kind of stuff either consciously or subconsciously and it you know it's, it comes out one way or the other so you never conceived or conceptualized pop as being a, a sound that you were after it was just whatever was was popular at the time yeah i mean people think like it's like skinny ties and rickenbacker guitars you know what i mean and it, that's not really what it is yeah i mean a good pop tune can be Strangers in the Night is a, is a great pop tune. Wichita Lineman. I mean, mm. you could just go on and on of great pop tunes. No, it's like refreshing to hear someone with greater authority than myself confirm what, <laughs> what I have believed about pop I music. I would bristle for a long on time. that power pop thing. Like, you know, it's become a genre. You know, like. It, well, in, in the hindsight, it's like in the rear view mirror, you're star, seeing it. Yeah. You've got the knack and big star and cheap trick. Cheap I trick, call yeah. Power pop, you know. I think what's interesting about it, though, is like for, for someone my age and, you know, being, being gener a generation or two generations removed from something is like the difference of how we view things through the lens of history yeah. versus how things may have been like in essence at the time. Totally. And I think with, you know, the access that my generation has had really since growing up, if it looked like the 90s was when you began to have like just widely distributed media uh, from all eras, right? It was like that's when you had home video and then like DVD and like CD, but then, you know, everything being reissued on CDs, then you move to iTunes. So right. like, you know, people my age very much grew up with an awareness of all of these things. That, did like, you have vinyl? I did. What well, well, my dad did Your as dad a kid. Did. Yeah. Right. And but then like buy records. CDs. No, not until I was like older as, yeah. you know, and I became a musician. But yeah. I just think about the way that that like has has reframed the perception of a lot of like movements artistically mm. yeah. versus how maybe the artists themselves or those communities and, and art scenes at the time would have been, you know, it's a very, would have interacted with the music or with the art. It's a different feeling. It's a, it's a different feeling. Like to have seen the Beatles the moment they played for the first time in America. That day after the Beatles played the Sullivan Show, I'd go to my bus stop and get on the school bus. I guess I was fourth grade, fifth grade. 
And you know, there were bullies on the bus and always jerks and people wouldn't let you sit in the bench with them and this and that. The day after the Beatles played, the whole bus was singing, I want to hold your hand and getting along with each other. That's beautiful. You, I mean, it was that galvanizing. It was like, it just, yeah. it was like, you know, not to, it's an overused cliche, but that moment in Wizard of Oz where it goes from black and white to color. It's like, okay, the 60s just began. That song still makes me weep every time I hear it. I think it's like one of the purest expressions of, of love and joy in a song ever. And it's such a simple song and such a beautiful, I want to hold your hand. Oh, I want, oh. It's such a simple song and such a beautiful song. It sounded it's so weird. too good for this world. The first time I heard the record and they were, I want to hold your hand and go up in that harmony. It was such a weird sound. If you'd never heard that before, they were different. They were really different. You knew, I mean, and it was really exciting because I lived in New York. And so, you know, they're landing in New York and they're, you know, they're, 30 miles from where I was, and you know, if you're watching it in the it's Plaza practically Hotel. in your living room. Yeah, right there. Well, okay. <laughs> I watched it in my living room. But it was so exciting, and it, it was so new and so fresh. And as we were talking about before, guitar rock and roll wasn't really prominent for a while. And they came and gave us back our rock and roll with, you know, roll over Beethoven and money, mm -hmm. and all, you know, you really got a hold on me, all, you know, Dizzy Miss Lizzy and all those songs. Uh, so they came back playing like American rock and roll, of course, fed through their experience of being uh, English and growing up in Liverpool. I don't want to be one of those people like, well, you know, you weren't there, you had to be there and blah, blah, blah. You could still love it. You could still, but there was something about being in the moment that like, you know, just like, oh my God, you know, you had nothing yeah. to prepare yourself, you know. No context. No. I mean, that's, that's what I was getting thing. after was I mean, like, just, you know. It, when, when you grow up uh, inundated with so much stuff, yeah, right. It's it. I feel like it can be lost on you a little bit. Although there is, but the, but the music is so powerful that I feel like you still have that that feeling when you hear it for the first time. Like I remember the first time I heard like Cashmere, or the first yeah. time that I heard Comfortably Numb. Like I remember yeah. hearing that and having no uh, proxy for what that was. Two great songs. Yeah. First time hearing those impressed me too. Yeah. Blew my mind. So I have one more question for you because when I was uh, doing my research for the interview, I saw that the Cars actually played their first gig at an Air Force base on yeah. New Year's Eve. Yes. What's the story of the Air Force base gig? We played our first gig. At an Air Force base. At an Air Force base. Because that's an actual uh, in, scene in, in New Hampshire. the movie Spinal Tap. They it play is. at an Air Force it base. It is. It is. I don't remember a whole lot about it, but it was probably like that. Not sure what we were doing there, how we got that gig, but it was our first gig. Okay, great. We have two, two questions from the community that <laughs> okay. um, uh, we had come in. So uh, this is a question from Saul. Okay. Um, Saul wants to know if there's any modern bands or, or music that's exciting you these days. You know, one band I really liked was, um, was an English band of young kids that played like the Yardbirds, the Stripes. I mean, I've just been recently listening to Matteo Mancuso uh, from Sicily. Oh, he's who's incredible. Just an incredibly gifted guitar player. I love Billy Strings. Mm -hmm. He's phenomenal. Um, I, I like Daniel Donato, guitarist. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. Daniel? I do, yeah. Um, I saw him play at the uh, an American Legion in Nashville for a swing dance. A phenomenal player. Yeah. Uh, J.D. Simo is another one who I, I've been watching for a few years now. I know he's not that young, but um, but neither am I. <laughs> um, <laughs> you had us fooled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still going. <laughs> yeah. Right. Uh, this is from Eric Sands. Um, Eric uh, wants to know, did you feel any pressure as a band to repeat the phenomenal success of the first album, having so many of those songs uh, get so much you know, airtime in radio play and, and, and have so much life on them? Was that ever something that crept in on the, the subsequent album, something you had to manage and work with? This is a very good question. Thank you, Eric, for the good question. Um, no, that was not the case with us. We never had A&R guys dropping in to see if there's any singles. We never had to deal with any of that. The first record did so well that they just left us alone. And we left us alone. It's not like there was a formula, but we just kept on doing what we were doing. And Rick would, 
you know, this is this year's batch of songs, and we've all grown, and there's some new technology out there, and Greg's got a, a new keyboard, or I've got some new gadget, and we'll try to incorporate it, and here comes the Lindrums, and we never felt the pressure to try to duplicate the success. In fact, when we made the record, we had no idea, you know, what it was going to do. Yeah. And I distinctly remember sitting around the house in England, and we had having a conversation with somebody, Ben or Rick, or someone saying, and just saying, this is so much fun. I hope we sell enough records that we could do this again. <laughs> and we just wanted. Hey, I feel like that's the best attitude you can have. Because we had such right? a good time making the record, we just I hope we can make another one. You know, Tom, Tom Petty said that. He was like, when we did the first album, I was just like, oh, I hope I can get a couple more years out of it. Like, I'm really enjoying yeah, doing you, this. And you, you got you a whole know, lifetime out of it. If you knew, everybody would have a hit. You know, I mean, yeah. that's the magic of it. You know, so you don't know, really. It's about capturing the public's imagination at a particular moment in time where that music is relevant to the life they're living. And it captures the zeitgeist. And maybe when you hear that first Cars album, it sounds like 1978. At the same yeah. time, it's almost impossible <laughs> for somebody like me to think about the songs that are on that album and, and to not think, how could you not know? Like, yeah, right? Yeah, they're just exactly. so good. When you're inside it, you're just yeah. trying to do good work. Well, we had, we had some encouraging hints by, the, mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that they flew us to England to make the record and rolled out the red carpet for this unknown band. So we had an idea that they saw the potential in us, you know. They had faith, they had faith in the songs yeah. that were on the demo. It was, it, we were able to get yeah. a hit in Boston without even ha making a record. I feel like that kind of echoes what is happening now with, with TikTok and with the way that artists are being discovered and developing. It's yeah. like you come to the table already with, you know, one or two songs that blow up online that you self-produce or, or recorded at home and then you're being courted by a label, but it's like you're already bringing you're already bringing the hit. It's kind of like come full circle in a way, like with you know, the beginning of what you, I guess, would call like an independent music scene, you know, to now as the artist being able to make that happen. But, but you guys were doing it before it was done that way. That's really unique. You know, it's just, it's just the way it rolled out. Oh, it was a great pleasure sitting down and thank chatting you, with you. Thank you, thank you. Elliot, thank you for welcoming us into your home, your my beautiful pleasure, studio here. My pleasure, my pleasure. Sharing your stories, it was great to hear you play, and glad you're loving this amp. I I'm, love it too. I'm loving, I'm loving the Spark stuff. I, I love the cab with my Spark Mini going through it, and also the, with my Spark Go. I have a Spark Go. Because this one's even more convenient. This one will slip into your gig bag, or in, you know, in, in a pocket of your carrying bag, and so it's like great for like practicing, like, you know, places where it wouldn't be convenient to bring an amp and even in places where that, you know, you couldn't fit that in a gig bag, but this just slide right in the pocket and sounds great, loud, and um, it's just really cool stuff. <laughs> You could fit the cab in your in your bag to take it to you. <laughs> It'd be a big bag, but I would try.